Hello again, ladies and gentlemen. This is Mr. Hill, Texas history teacher for Team Michigan State here at Owsley Junior High School. And today we are going to be learning about the cattle industry in Texas. Now, if you are an at-home learner, if you're doing this virtually, please make sure that you make a copy of the Cornell Notes um, and follow along as you watch this video, filling in the blanks as you go. Um, if you are in class, more than likely you're going to have a paper copy in front of you. So just follow along and, um, and we will uh, learn a little bit about cattle in Texas. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. So first things first, we have an essential question. And today's essential question is, what factors led to the boom and the bust in the Texas cattle industry. Now, if you remember from seeing your key terms, um, boom and bust means boom is when things are going really, really well, and bust is when things are going really, really poorly. So if you're talking about the economy, boom means that the economy is going great, people are making money, people are spending money. Bust means that things are on the downward turn. Uh, people are not making as much money or they're not um, they're not spending money and it kind of slows the economy and and things are sort of bad so what factors led to the boom and the bust in the texas cattle industry now you guys do know i'm assuming that cattle are cows okay uh, cattle means uh, bovines uh, the big animals that you know we get hamburger and and milk from so, um, first, first thing we need to know is a little bit about the growth of the cattle industry in Texas. And you need to understand, cows are not an animal that was just here in North America. Uh, they were not native to North America. In fact, there were no cows in the Americas, in the New World, until they were introduced to Texas by the Spanish explorers. They were brought to Texas by the Spanish explorers. Now, over time, as American settlers came to Texas, they brought their cattle with them. And their cattle was uh, traditionally cattle that had been brought here from England, um, English uh, uh, breeds of cow. So when the Spanish cattle that was already here brought hundreds of years earlier by the, by the Spaniards, when it mixed with that English cattle, it made a completely different breed of animal called the Texas Longhorn. So to kind of give you an idea, the Spanish brought several different breeds of cattle. One of them was called Retenta. Uh, they're a, a, a breed of cattle that is native to Spain. Uh, the Retenta was brought here. Over time, they would... Uh, they wandered off from their herds. They formed wild herds of retenta, and they lived wild out on the prairie. The same thing with the English cattle. Uh, like, for example, the one that I'm showing you here is the Hereford. Uh, so it's a kind of a red-colored animal with a white face and, and white markings on it. So over time, uh, because back then fences were very difficult and very expensive to make. So animals just roamed free on the prairie. And when the Spanish cattle met the English cattle, uh, they had a tendency to intermingle. And the result, uh, if a retenta cattle or retenta cow had a, a calf with a Hereford, uh, over time, as the, as the mixture continued, they became a completely new breed of animal called the Texas Longhorn. So, cattle ranching in Texas began to be a large industry in about 1836, after the Revolution. Uh, more and more people came to Texas and began raising cows, uh, raising uh, bulls, heifers, cattle, um, they began raising them and they found that they could turn around and sell them for a nice profit. Um, and the industry really grew large because, as you know, um, the, probably the biggest use we have for cattle is for the beef that comes from them when they are, uh, when they're slaughtered. So cheap land here in Texas, uh, 
um, where a man could come and buy thousands of acres of land at a, at a really decent price, a low price. Um, and the fact that there were open ranges, meaning large amounts of land with no fences, it made it easy to raise large herds. And the great thing about it is, you know, you can turn your cattle loose on this open range and over time they're going to to start having offspring and your herd is going to grow and after a couple of years those offspring are going to start having cattle of you know having calves of their own and it just grows and grows to where it wouldn't be unusual for a large rancher to have thousands and thousands of heads of cattle so just like the longhorn came from a mix of spanish and english cattle texas ranching was a mix of Spanish and English methods. Um, the Spaniards, uh, when they came here, and then, uh, you know, Mexican cowboys, they had their own uh, style of, of how they tended to cattle. The Americans, when they came here, they had their own style. And over time, the mixing of the two cultures led to the growth of what we consider to be today the Texas cowboy. Uh, the broad hat, um, the you know the kerchief around the neck, the the, the bandana thing, uh, the the leather chaps that they would wear to cover their legs to protect them when they had to ride through bushes, the the boots with the pointed toes, the saddles, um, it just became a uh, it became uh, whereas at one time it was two different cultures, it just became the Texas culture of cowboy living. So. To kind of understand cattle ranching, you need to understand the open range. Um, there was a time in Texas where there really were no fences, uh, not like we see today. Uh, it Once you got past a certain point, it was just open range. It was just thousands and thousands and thousands of acres of land that were just covered in grass. And it was um, it was available to anyone. So these vast amounts of open land in Texas led to an explosion of the cattle population where the cattle just ran free and were able to just go and do whatever they wanted to do, which, you know, eventually meant making little baby cows. So between 1860, oh, I'm sorry, by 1865, between three and six million wild longhorn cattle roam the plains. Meaning when I say wild, they were owned by no one. If someone wanted some cattle, all they had to do was go out with some cowboys and round up some cows and, and bring them to, to their place. Uh, they would brand them to show ownership. A brand is like a, uh, um, it's a, a, an iron a rod with a special design on the end of it. It's put in a fire, it burns really, really hot, turns red, and when it's pressed to the cattle's skin, uh, it would burn their hide and it would make a permanent mark on them. So each rancher had their own uh, unique brand that they would put on their cattle so that they would be able to tell whose cattle was whose. So let's talk now a little bit about the economics of cattle. You know, we've talked about pegs, political, economic, geographic, and social. Let's talk about the economics, the money side of cattle. During the Civil War, the cattle industry in Texas sort of declined because of the war. Uh, people in the North wanted cattle um, uh, because the North was no longer, um, you know, a friend. They were an enemy. Uh, they lost that portion of their business. Um, also, the fact that so many of the men were away uh, fighting in the war, uh, it just caused the industry to sort of decline. But after the war, the demand for beef increased, and Texas had the cattle to meet that demand. Remember, big cities in the north like Chicago and New York, they were massive cities with hundreds of thousands of people living there, and those people needed to be fed, and they wanted beef. So, Lots of cattle in Texas meant that there was a low demand for meat in Texas. And what that means is because everybody had cattle in Texas or, or it was readily available. So here in Texas, if you wanted to buy a cow to slaughter and eat, you could buy a cow for three or four dollars. They weren't expensive. Everybody had cattle. And because there were so many of them, people were having to lower their price just to get people 
you know, other people to buy their cattle. Ranchers would, would like, who had thousands of heads of cattle, they were competing against other ranchers who had thousands of head of cattle. And in order to get people to buy their cattle, they had to lower and lower and lower the price until it was just really dirt cheap to buy an entire cow. Now, in the north and the east, because there was such a high demand um, and there weren't a lot of cows up there, the, the price for a cow could be 10 times what it was in Texas. Whereas in Texas, you could buy a cow for 3 or $4. In the north, in the east, like in Chicago, um, in New York, cows sold for as much as 30 or $40 per, per, per head. So what this does... And here's supply and demand, boom and bust. Um, when there is a high demand for beef, there is few cattle available and people want that beef. So the prices go up. That's a boom. Okay. When there's a high supply, when there's a lot of them, um, the price tends to go down because sellers are competing against themselves. If one guy wants to sell a cow for $30, another guy says, well, hey, I'll sell you that same cow, that same type of cow. I'll sell it to you for 25. Well, then the first one goes, well, wait, he's selling it for 25. I'll give it to you for 20. So it has a tendency to cause the price to go down. And then, of course, if there's a low demand, uh, because sometimes the cattle would get sick, and when one cow gets sick, just sort of like our quarantine situation that we have here today because of COVID, um, the more, uh, if, if one person comes in and they're sick, it can cause more people to become infected. Well, when cattle became sick, it made it to where their meat was dangerous to eat. Um, so because the cattle was sick, uh, if in situations like that, uh, nobody wanted to eat it and it caused the prices to go down and it was a bust. So in order to get the cattle from Texas to the north, uh, they had to be driven, not in a car or not in a, on a bus or in a truck or anything because they didn't have those things back then. They had to be taken in a large herd and they had to be forced, pushed to, to walk to a place where there were uh, railroads. Railroads, because Texas at the time had railroads, but the railroads did not connect to the north. So in order to get to places where the railroad did connect to the north and the cows could be put in cars and shipped to different places, the cattle had to be driven from Texas to places like Dodge City, Kansas, uh, Kansas City. So these cattle drives started after the Civil War in 1866. They almost always took place in the spring because of the mild weather and there was plenty of grass for the cattle. Uh, to try to move cattle in the winter, it's very difficult. The grass dries and dies, especially in cold weather, or it's covered by snow or frost on, on some days. So cattle drives almost always happen during the spring. Now, like I said before, because the railroads didn't yet connect Texas to the north, cattle had to be driven to cities like Dodge City, Kansas, or Abilene, Kansas, um, and then they were loaded onto train cars and shipped where there was a high demand for those cattle. Now, cattle drives were very difficult work. Uh, they would have to hire cowboys. Uh, the cowboys, you know, maybe 30 cowboys would be in charge of thousands of head of cattle, and they would, um, they would have to, to constantly make sure the cattle didn't wander off, that they stayed, and that they were moving in the right direction. Now, on cattle drives, the cowboys had to worry about bandits, and they had to worry about Indian attacks because a lot of times they had to push their herds right through Indian territory up into the middle of the, the United States, the Midwest, and they had to deal with a lot of dangers from, uh, from, from Native Americans. Uh, they also had to deal with thunderstorms. Now, we, we tend to think of thunderstorms as, uh, as being not that big a deal, but then again, when we deal with a thunderstorm, we're usually under a roof in a brick house somewhere. Um, these cowboys and thousands of head of cattle were out on the open prairie, uh, exposed to the wind and the rain and the hail and the thunder and the lightning uh, and, it, and flash floods that could come from a, a heavy rain. Uh, also, the cowboys spent long hours in the saddle. They would wake up usually before the sun came up. They would eat. They would get on the back of their horse, and they would be on the horse until it was time to get off and go to bed at night. Uh, and that can be hard on a guy's rear end, you know. <laughs> 
They also had to deal with stampedes. Uh, you know, when one cow runs at you, it's a scary enough thing. But imagine thousands of uh, cows becoming scared uh, and all moving in one direction uh, and you were in their path. It, it was a very, very dangerous thing. Also, they had to deal with extreme heat. Uh, you know yourself, uh, living in Texas, it can get very hot. And imagine, you know, wearing a, a long sleeve shirt, a hat, a bandana around your neck, a pair of uh, long pants, uh, leather chaps on top of that, and boots, uh, and sitting on horseback in the beating down sun of the summer. Um, it can be uh, it can be very hard to deal with, and I'm sure a lot of cowboys, if they didn't drink enough, they fell out because of the heat. So here's some, um, this is kind of sort of a myth versus reality thing. Now we, we see old movies and we see the cowboys and you know the, the sort of mythological idea of a cowboy was that they were tall and handsome and rugged. Uh, they were usually white guys. Now of course this, this comes from us watching movies and stuff from the 1940s and 50s and 60s. And uh, we always imagine that cowboys, you know, had a really easy life, just riding on the back of a horse, making a lot of money. Their days were having fun. Uh, filled with fun that they, they had constant cowboy and Indian fights, you know, like we, you know, people used to have when they were kids. But in reality, it was a lot different. Um, in reality, cowboys were usually really, really young, uh, from like their early teens uh, into their 20s. About 12% of cowboys on cattle drives were Mexican, and about 25% of those cowboys on those cattle drives were black. They were usually small guys of medium build because large men are too heavy for horses. Uh, they worked long, difficult 18-hour days that were often just extremely boring, sitting on the back of a horse looking at cows. Uh, cows moving, cows eating, cows, you know, going to the bathroom. Uh, it, it was pretty boring work. Uh, they also got low pay. Uh, it really wasn't that that great a pay for for being a cowboy, and it was high risk. There was a lot of danger involved, and they rarely, if ever, actually fought Indians. As a matter of fact, they would have preferred to never even see Indians when they were out on the trail. So, as we're talking about the railroads, um, by the you know in the early days there were no railroads that connected Texas to the north, so these cattle drives were absolutely necessary. But by the 1800s, though, railroads reached into West Texas, and now there was no need for cattle drives. They could literally just load the cattle onto a train car here in Texas and ship it north instead of having to spend, you know, weeks and, and maybe months uh, moving the cattle just, a, you know, a few miles a day um, from Texas to, to Kansas. Now, the open range thing was a was a big deal because you had all these people who had all of this land uh, but there were no fences that separated it and there were farmers who had who tried to grow crops and cattle would just wander onto their land and would um, and would eat their crops and and over time people wanted and needed fences and because of this open range a lot of times it would cause a lot of hard feelings and there were a lot of dangerous situations that arose from fights and and feuds between ranchers and farmers and in the 18 late 1800s a man named Joseph Glidden um, invented something called barbed wire it's a, a wire a twisted wire and in between about every six or eight inches there are these little twists of sharp cut off metal I know you guys know what barbed wire is and uh, when a cow would run into it with its nose or its body and it would feel that prick of the, uh, of the little barb there, it would, it would back off. So barbed wire became a cheap, a relatively cheap and easy way to fence in an area. So fenced in, they fin farmers and ranchers fenced in property to keep cattle in and to keep cattle rustlers out. A rustler was a person who would steal cattle. And the problem is, if you were a small rancher and you had a relatively small area of land, if the big ranchers put fences around their property, the land that your cows at one time were able to go on to and, and to eat and to get water, all of a sudden that fence is there, your cattle doesn't have access to water. And if you're a, a, a farmer or a rancher and you have this little plot of land, I'm sorry, a rancher and you have this little plot of land and you're 
your cows are used to being able to roam anywhere they want to get a drink or to eat. You know, you, your cows can eat up your grass really quick, faster than it can grow. And if you don't have an adequate water supply and you can't, and you don't have a windmill to bring water up to water your cattle, then your cows are going to die. So this uh, end of the open range was really tough on small ranchers. So in summary, the need for beef in the north led to the boom. Cattle disease, supply and demand changes led to the bust. So there you have it. That's our lesson for today. Uh, make sure that you take your notes, uh, make sure you fill them in accurately, uh, and make sure that you take the quiz that goes along with this set of notes. And until next time, we'll talk to you later.